Good morning, everybody. Warm welcome to all of you to <clears throat> week uh, three of our um, of our class of our course on marriage and family. I hope all of you are doing well. It's good to see some of you in. Uh, welcome to all our e-learning students also for making time to listen, to learn, and to go alongside with us <clears throat> on the course. Um, let's just start with a word of prayer, and then we'll move right in. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your presence and for your guidance with us over the last one week. Thank you that your grace and mercy has led us so wonderfully, so marvelously. Lord, even as we look to you, we sit together, Lord, in this class of learning about Christian marriage and family. Father, we pray that you will align us to your word. You will align us to your truth. Give us the wisdom we need. Father, we pray that we will be guided by your spirit. Lord, in every decision that we take in marriage and outside of marriage. Father, I pray for every student here. Lord, I thank you for their homes, for their lives. Wherever they are in right now, thank you for the plan and purpose that you have for them. Lead them, God, in your guidance, in your strength. But even as we learn together, I pray this will be a time of enriching, of equipping, and Holy Spirit, um, also a time where you convict us, Lord, to live according to your ways. We ask all this in your precious name. Amen. All right. Thank you once again for coming in. I hope all of you can hear me, and I hope I can hear you all as well. Uh, just it would be great just to, for someone to just unmute and say a hello because I think sometimes there's a problem with my Google Meet. Just somebody just saying hello. Hello, ma'am. Okay. Hi, Chita. Okay, I can hear you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So um, we looked at uh, uh, last week, we were looking at how we prepare for marriage and we looked at seven areas of preparation. Would somebody like to quickly just take everybody through a refresher of those seven points that we spoke about last week? Quickly, seven points. Uh, you could just tell me the headings, uh, just share the headings. That'll be, that'll be like a refresher for all of us on this call. Any one person? Yes, Anand. Yeah, somebody? Becoming, Shiva Kumar? Becoming, yes, Anand, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. Becoming the best you. Mm -hmm. First one. The second one is uh, about the emotional health you. Mm hmm uh third one is about this uh, management personally okay and the fourth one is about uh, uh finances sorry relationship skills okay and the fifth one is uh it's about overcoming past abuses trauma what mm -hmm. we went through this in this childhood in our mm -hmm. Uh, about all these things what happened mm -hmm. in our lives and the sixth thing is the sexual purity okay and the last one is about the maturity of uh, calling for the ministry okay thank you so much Anand thank you appreciate <clears throat> that yeah so we looked at those seven areas of preparation um, we looked at uh, looked at them in some detail. We will continue uh, picking up from that and really building on it over our next few classes also. So uh, today we are going to we're, we're continuing um, the larger topic of how we build a strong foundation for marriage. And um, we're on chapter three right now today, and it's um, uh, this entire chapter is. Uh, deals with practical and biblical guidelines on how uh, you can make a choice 
of a of a person you want to marry okay um so this is this is what do we do what kind of guidelines that we can we keep in mind as we are making that choice now when we're looking through this entire chapter because <clears throat> we all come from probably different cultural contexts we want to be aware that um how we choose to marry or how we make a choice can vary in across cultures it can vary uh, you know especially in india it can vary from state to state it can vary from region to region um it can vary from country to country so even as we look at this chapter we are cognizant of the fact that everyone may not have the freedom or an opportunity to put into application all of that which is presented in this chapter okay because there can be different factors that prevent one from really going with some of these guidelines there could be parental factors there could be factors with regard to society expectations maybe from from your family or from a society uh so in case if there are some some situations like this um we we uh, we stand and know that god is above all of that and he's above sovereign over over everything so to be to come to a place of bringing it to the lord surrendering it to the lord yielding it to the lord and looking at him to work on your behalf even though there may be some of these constraints that you would find yourself in okay so um even if it if you're not able to completely apply it because of the kind of uh, uh cultural background or a familial um concern that you're coming from remember to submit it to the lord and allow him to work through the choices that you make okay so um we're going to initially look at when we are making the choice what is something that we need to broadly understand and i want to bring about a word here which is compatibility okay now the word compatibility uh, what does it mean it's it's an ability of um two people to be able to exist together to live together in agreement that's that's uh, it is it is a place of agreement compatibility is where you coming together to be a place of agreement or in other words an ability to be one together to be yoked together okay it's also uh, uh, compatibility also comes from a place um, of understanding where two people in walking in marriage are able to come to a place of understanding compatibility also is where two people are able to see that they are different yet see these differences uh, as one way or as a as a potential or as an opportunity where they can work together so that's what we're looking at compatibility so as we've been looking up in our different in our earlier chapters that marriage is uh, coming together of two people right of two different individuals and this uh coming together being one this union is in the body in the soul as well as the spirit and that's the place of agreement right that that you're looking so it's an important place to look at to be compatible in these uh three realms the spirit the soul and the and the body and so we will look at each of them uh uh in a little bit of detail okay so let's look the first is spiritual compat compatibility okay uh, so when when we're looking at spiritual compatibility we want to see and and um share that it it's just not enough for two people who are uh, coming together in marriage to um uh, just be believers right yes being believers is a very important and a necessary thing to walk in agreement it's important to move a little ahead of that in understanding what could be the commitment or the the way the the love the 
the attention, the compassion, the passion that they use or they have in establishing that relationship with God? Or what are the disciplines that they carry out in their walk with God? What, uh, what, do, what uh, do they see as their calling or as their destiny is? So, it, so as we said, being believers is just not enough, but that both have similar commitments, similar passions, and similar disciplines uh, that will help them to grow together, to work with uh, work with one another. Okay, so um, why why is this important? Is that um, uh, let's say even in disciplines of marriage, maybe one one person um, uh, is disciplined every day to read scripture, uh, to be at a time of prayer, to go in for maybe for, for Bible studies, spending a lot more time in devotion, whereas the other person may not be, may, may just be a Sunday goer. So this difference in this kind of a spiritual passion can, of course, become a place of conflict, right? Now, even uh, so, even as we've said this, if there are any of us over here who are married uh, and realize that there is a, an incompatibility in this, that, that may exist in this area, uh, this definitely is not an excuse that we can use to move away from one another. Uh, it is to be able to uh, be aware, recognize that there is this difference, and keep working on the marriage uh, with the help of God and wisdom in this area. Okay, so that's that. That's the first one. What we're looking at is spiritual compatibility. The second one that we're looking at is emotional and intellectual compatibility. Now we do see that the soul, the soul has the intellect, the mind, the will, and the emotions. It is in that level that you connect with one another. Okay, so when you are making a choice of a person. One area to check of compatibility is how well you are able to relate with somebody else emotionally and also intellectually. Is there a, is there a place where you can mutually understand one another? Are you able to uh, respect each other? Are you able to understand what kind of emotions a person is going through? How, how best do you find yourself expressing your emotions together? Is there um, a, a place of comfort in being able to understand each other's emotions, right? Now, it's true that, uh, you know, marriage is a journey and it's not something that you may be able to determine in the initial probably weeks uh, of of your interaction with the person. Now, have a, a, a very uh, broad idea of, of the kind of compatibility that you uh, also is uh, intellectual uh, compatibility between two of you. Are there areas where you can actually talk and share, relate, uh, uh, connect, uh, create, and join things together? So these are the two specific areas. Again, we're going. We understand for those of us who are married. If you do find incompatibility in any of this area, it is not a reason to move away, but it is to recognize the difference and keep working uh, together, taking the help of God through these uh, areas: the emotional and the intellectual area. The third one is the physical compatibility. Now, physical compatibility is about being, finding, and being. Um, attracted to, in, in a way that you appreciate or, uh, or beauty that you see. So there's nothing wrong in being uh, excited about that, OK? However, it's not something that we take out of context. It, it has its right place. And it, that shouldn't be the primary reason for why you make a decision. The physical compatibility, the way someone looks, or their beauty, or their appearance, shouldn't be the only reason why you want to marry someone, although it is important to feel physically attracted to the person that you're married. Okay.
And the fourth one is compatibility in life's calling. So in this area, uh, it is to understand what you want to do uh, in life, what God is calling you. Uh, Also, um, completely. Nevertheless, you get a good sense when when you get into conversations with them, right? Uh, in one is, does the person have a, a recognition that God's calling them to do something or something that they want uh, that uh, God is intending for them to pursue, right? Because um, why is this important is if there are two people who, when they come together in marriage, um, one may have a certain idea, the other may have a opposing idea. And this in itself, again, can cause a lot of dissatisfaction and later uh, a sense of conflict that may come about. May have uh, an understanding of getting ministry, whereas the other person may want to you know, work on in a corporate uh, setting or maybe build a business. Um, so to understand, to ensure that uh, it doesn't lead to dissatisfaction and thereby having a conflict as a result. Okay, So these are four areas of compatibility uh, that, that, that we can broadly look at even as we make a choice. Okay? Now, even as um, uh, 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 you're looking for these areas of compatibility that you need to look out for is to really check to see any signs of any warning sign, um, whether there are things or indicational areas of difficulties that make if you do see such signs, if you do observe such signs, uh, it's important to resolve these or address these before marriage. So uh, to critically look at some of these areas, because you know, um, uh, with, with a lot of experience with working with people, um, a lot of times people get into marriage uh, without really um, considering some of these because of the emotional space that they are in, right? They feel there's so much in connection with the other person, so much in love with them that some of these signs that we're going to be talking about, some of these warning signs get overlooked or we feel that they aren't too significant um, in that relationship. But but these are definitely certain red flags that you need to consider, need to bring in conversations, need to get addressed before you make that choice. Okay? So we look at some of these uh, these. Uh, these red flags, so some of these warning signs that are indicators that could be probably um, uh, uh, that could be uh, potential problem areas. Okay, so the first is the signs. Now, how does this uh, how does this pan out, or how do you see of this is in the way that um, uh, how responsible are they in the things that surround them? In the in their own place, in the way that they have towards um, the people who are close to them. what kind of readiness are they showing for marriage and for family? Um, have they been to an understanding of marriage, have they preparing themselves financially in being able to take responsibility of uh, standing in that role of marriage. And it's just not in one area, but in multiple areas. There are signs of authority that, that is a red flag. The second one is signs of a lack of preparation. Uh, so how are they taking time to prepare themselves that 
as we discussed uh, earlier, right? How much of a uh, preparation are we taking? Home to bring the bride, and the bride waits on and um, red. Um, uh, issues within uh, within their within their for example, um, are they holding a job well? Uh, are there repeated jobs that they are significant issues, emotional? Uh, manage their own uh, personal the next one is parental control any signs of parental control what do you notice about uh, the relationship that the person has uh, ten. involved even in the marriage they become as the next spouse who is there in the marital relationship so any kind of uh, so any control uh, can can definitely be detrimental to the marriage uh, yes Anand I think you have a question would you like to unmute and share Uh, are you all able to hear me? Are you able to hear me? Am I... Uh, Anand, I think you raised your hand. Was it for a question or... I, okay, you all are able to hear me. Is there anything that you all want me to repeat? If you all have not heard anything, is there anything that you want me to repeat? Ma'am, can you unmute yourself? Can you unmute yourself? I'm unmuted. Uh, Anand, you can't hear me? Can you hear me now? Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are audible now. Okay, so could you share with me till where you all heard? Is there is there some parts that you all didn't hear? You missed a little bit. Um, could somebody tell me where where you missed so that I could just uh, repeat that? Which part of it is it that you all missed? Yes, ma'am. When you when you start the war, uh, warning signs from there, we got problem. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, okay. So I I will just go through that once again. Okay. So we were we were looking at warning signs. We said what uh, how what do we take? All right. The red flags weren't very clear. All right. So the warning signs are indicators that there can be problem areas in the in the marriage so what are the potential problem areas so we will look we will look at a few of them the first one is uh, the signs of immaturity so uh, when we look at this area we're looking at to see how responsible the person is in his own life 
in being able to manage his own self, in being able to manage things around him, maybe a job, maybe whatever uh, he's been called, to, the person has been called to do, any kind of a um, uh, uh, inability or, or a lack or a slack of things over there could show that the person may be immature or even for preparation towards marriage, taking on the responsibility of marriage. So in order to take a responsibility of marriage, one needs to take care of multiple number of things before they can get into, um, into, into marriage. So if that is something that's not there, if they are slack in doing so, if, if it is taken very, very flippantly, the, uh, the, these could express signs of immaturity. Okay. The second one is signs of lack of preparation. We looked through those seven areas last week. Uh, and if you find that the person is uh, avoiding or not focusing on one or more areas, uh, it shows that there isn't a, that they aren't moving or aren't taking marriage or taking the preparation seriously. Now that becomes a red flag because this is one of the most important decisions a person takes in their life. And if they aren't doing um, anything to get themselves equipped, to get themselves in a better position for marriage, then you would see that as a lack of preparation. The third one is character weakness, signs of character weakness. Now in this is any kind of issues or concerns in one's personality, in the way that um, in the way that they lead themselves, in the way that they relate to people, in the way that they're able to hold a job, in the way that they are able to deal with their stress, deal with emotions, uh, also in the way um, uh, how what kind of coping patterns do they have when there are struggles or difficulties that come? What do they turn to in order to experience? A sense of equilibrium. Um, uh, what kind of what are what are some of the uh, what are some addictions that you may see? All of this expresses how the person carries out oneself, carries out uh, himself or herself. So, if there are any kind of weaknesses here, that becomes uh, any weaknesses that they are not willing to work on, they're not willing to identify, becomes again a red flag. The next one is parental control, signs of parental control, when the person's parents become overly controlling, become uh, over, uh, they're, they're extremely dominant, and there is a lot of interference in, in the way that the parents uh, work alongside with the person. Maybe all decisions are made by them, uh, uh, and there is a control over who they should marry, what they should do, uh, where they should go, what they should wear, all of that. If that's if that if if that's something that you see, that again becomes a red flag. Also, if there is significant dependence, parental dependence, that is the person uh, you're considering to marry is highly dependent and um, uh, very very strongly attached to the parents, and so what you would see is that they would probably even in marriage give a lot more of importance to the family to the uh, to the parents more than establishing a relationship with the uh, with with the with the spouse and lastly is to also um, uh, discuss and see what parents or spiritual mentors say about the person one is considering you know, uh, uh, what, what what are their thoughts? What are they able to see? Um, what are some warning signs that they may see that you may be blinded to? So all of these things are, are things that um, become potential areas. And to be able to consider this, uh, you know, and not keep a blind eye or keep a closed eye if some of these are uh, seen out, OK? Um, any questions up until now? before we move on. Uh, we spoke about compatibility and we spoke about warning signs. Any questions? OK, so we, we will move on. Um, so here, uh, it, now we're just going to look at certain practical guidelines um, uh, 
as as you as you make uh, our responsibilities when you're making a choice when you're making um uh, the decision to to marry okay uh, if you look at james chapter 1 verse 8 um uh, a double minded man is is uh, scripture talks about a double minded man who is unstable in all his all his ways okay so um, when you make a decision or when you firm up a certain expectation, you will find that you will be able to uh, find what you're looking for. So it is important not to just walk into marriage without an understanding or without an expectation, because the responsibility uh, lies with us, with, with us as people to make a choice. Okay, so God puts on us uh, as a responsibility to make a choice, keeping the larger guidelines in man in in marriage. Okay, so God has given each of us the choice and the liberty and the freedom to make the choice of who to marry. And so, in order to do in order to do that, we must um, firmly make up our minds and understand or, or know what we want in marriage or what we want to see in the person we are marrying so it is it's it's a good practice to be able to write down and uh put down areas of um uh, uh things that you expect areas of expectation or things that you expect you would like to see in your partner or the person you want to marry because and it is important to be sure about it to be firm about it so that there isn't any any cause of uh, a question at a later point of time okay so be clear about the kind of person you would like to marry and and even as you are putting down those expectations be realistic you know be um uh, it's it, so, so many times when people come up with expectations, <coughs> excuse me, people come up with expectations, um, they want things, uh, you know, they want the moon uh, and, and all of that. So be realistic in the way that you are expecting uh, or the way that you determine who you'd like to marry. So uh, take time to really think about the qualities that are important to you or the traits that you would like to see in the person you want to marry. So bring about bring about a list and make it an exhaustive list, right? Um, it's important to know specific details about what you are looking for. Determine to see what is extremely critical for you and also determine to see what, what may be good to have, even though it may not be critical, what may be good to have. Write down what your expectations are of marriage. What is it that you would want to see? How do you visualize um the home and the family coming up what is it that you would like to see about your home and family you know build a picture of it or bring words to it understand what is it that you'd like because when you have a clear picture in mind then you're you're definitely seeking for someone who will be able to walk alongside with you to to create a, a marriage like that um so uh, again what is important to remember is that even though uh, it's not marriage is not not everything about what you can get from the other person. It is also what you can bring, what you can, um, uh, how you can also add value into the into the marriage. So at the same time, take time to really understand and reflect what are some qualities or traits that you will bring into the marriage, or you bring. Um, uh, or because of who you are or what what kind of a person you are that can that you can bring in for the benefit of your of the person you're marrying okay think about how you would like to build your home and your family alongside um with your spouse okay so uh, even when you look at answering these questions be be um be be practical, uh, be authentic, and uh, uh, you know, be be more specific rather than being extremely vague because it can actually help you build a certain framework into marriage. Okay, now we we move on to the next part. Is even while we are thinking about uh, these questions uh, to bring about the clarity uh, clarity about um, what we are looking for and 
who we would like uh, uh, to marry. Uh, we, we just want to address a certain framework or a certain question, um, uh, even as you're making this decision, OK? And the, and the question here is, is there an appointed one and only? Is there this one person that that is kept somewhere in the world for me for me to marry? Okay, Is there that specific appointed one and only person? So uh, we'd, I'd like to, we'd like to take uh, some learnings from one of the, uh, um, you know, a, a, a good love story that's there in the Bible. And I'd like someone to read it out. It's from Genesis chapter 24, verses 1 to 15. Genesis 24, 1 to 15. Um, it's a fairly long um, chapter, uh, long passage, but it's okay. I think we can, we can read it because just to get some insights into this question, is there this one and only person for me to marry? So is there someone who can read out Genesis 24, 1 to 15? Abraham was now very old, and the Lord had blessed him in everything he did. He said to his oldest servant, who was in charge of all that he had, place your hand between my thighs and make a vow. I want you to make a vow in the name of the Lord that the God of heaven and earth, that you will not choose a wife for my son from the people here in Canaan. You must go back to the country where I was born and get a wife for my son Isaac from among my relatives. But a servant asked, what if the young woman will not leave home to come with me to this land? Shall I send your son back to the land you came from? Abraham answered, make sure that you don't send my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, brought me from the home of my father and from the land of my relatives. And he sol solemnly promised me that he would give this land to my descendants. He will send his angel before you so that you can get a wife there for my son. If the young woman is not willing to come with you, you will be free from this promise. But you must not, under any circumstances, take my son back there. So the servant put his hand between the thighs of Abraham, his master, and made a vow to do what Abraham had asked. The servant, who was in charge of Abraham's property, took ten of his master's camels and went to the city where Nahor had lived in northern Mesopotamia. When he arrived, he made the camels kneel down at the well outside the city. It was late afternoon, the time when women came out to get water. He prayed, Lord, God of my master, Abraham, give me success today and keep your promise to my master. Here I am at the well where the young women of the city will be coming to get water. I will say to one of them, please lower your jar and let me have a drink. If she says, drink and I will also bring water for your camels. May she be the one that you have chosen for your servant Isaac. If this happens, I will know that you have kept your promise to my master. Before he had finished praying, Ab uh, sorry, Rebecca arrived with a water jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, who was the son of Abraham's brother Nahor and his wife Milka. Ma'am, can you please unmute? So sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, right. Okay, so the uh, this is a story of how Abraham sends his servant to send a bride for Isaac, mm, uh, and uh, we're looking at this passage basically to understand this one question: Is there that that one and only um, person that uh, that that we we have to find to be married. Okay, so we're just going to look at certain insights. So if we look at verse eight, okay, it says, if the young woman is not willing to come with you, you will be free from this promise. Abraham is telling, is telling his servant this, right? If the young woman is not willing to come with you. So what does uh, Abraham recognize he recognizes that there can be a possibility that this whoever this young woman is she 
can make a decision to not come along. Even though there may be some signs or certain things that he's seeing, there is a possibility that this woman that uh, uh, that will be that is being considered or that is being sent may not agree or may not may not come uh, come about. Okay, so um, uh, what what we are seeing over here is that uh, Abraham did go. Abraham's servant did go in search of a bride and was depending on the Lord for that guidance. Okay, And one of the ways that he had to discern that guidance is what you will see um, uh, you know, later in a verse, uh, uh, later on in, in that chapter, you will see that uh, once Rebecca comes, the servant is actually watching her uh, to see if if it was the right person, if, if she was the right right person. Okay, so I think it's verse uh, 20, 21. It says, the man kept watching her in silence, um, watching her in silence to see if the Lord had given him success. Okay, so uh, although he went with that uh, uh, understanding that God is guiding him into, he also had the possibility of knowing that this woman could have would have or could have said said no to to the person so um what what when you look at the way that abraham's uh, servant um uh, went about this he did not just stay back and think that okay somehow uh, you know somebody would come into his house and uh, you know ask for for a groom to be married okay but what you see that abraham's servant did is he actually stepped out in faith he went out to search for for a bride okay and that was uh, and he also had a practical way of recognizing what god was guiding him to do so although he went with a guidance went with the wisdom god had given him went with some way of uh, recognizing that God was guiding. He was also um, aware of the fact that the that the that the woman or the or the girl would could could say no. Okay. Now, uh, when we are depending on God's guidance, uh, remember we as New Testament believers, we have the Holy Spirit to guide us in our spirit. Okay. And uh, as, as Romans 12, 2 says that we have been called to, to make use of our renewed minds to prove what is good, what is acceptable, and what is pleasing to him. Okay, So we as believers do have the presence of the Holy Spirit to bring us to a place of gui guidance. God has called us to renew our minds so that we can understand and prove what is pleasing to to the lord okay as you keep going on in that story you will also see in verses 49 to 51 um, we see that abraham's servant did not override the choice and will of um, of the family of rebecca they did not he did not say okay i came from from uh, from here and this is what i had asked the lord and the lord uh, showed me all of this. It matches up exactly well. There isn't a mistake to it. So this is what it it should be. But if you look at the if you look at uh, Genesis twenty four forty nine to fifty one, I'll read that out. Um, now, if you intend to fulfill your responsibility towards my master and treat him fairly, please tell me. If not, say so, and I will decide what to do. Laban and Bethuel answered, since this matter comes from the Lord, it is not for us to make a decision. Here is Rebekah, take her and go. Let her become the wife of your master's son, as the Lord himself has said. So what do you see here? Abraham did recognize God's guidance through that entire process of uh, you know, the well and the water and the camels. And uh, he saw Rebecca, uh, but he went and met Rebecca's family. He did not use any kind of force or spiritual understanding <clears throat> to make them do what he, he felt was right or he saw as God guiding him. 
but he goes them and help lets them make that decision <clears throat> to see if they were they were willing okay and they and and it says he was still willing to uh, to to take no for an answer it says in verse 49 please tell me if not say so and i will decide what to do so they were he was also willing to take no for an answer and decide to what uh, to to do what they had um, chosen to do. So we also find later on in that chapter, verses 54 to 59, ultimately, even though all of this happened, it was Rebecca's decision. We'll just read through that. That's uh, Genesis 24, verses 54 to 59. Can somebody else read that, please? Genesis 54, uh, 24, verses 54 to 59. Could somebody read that? Somebody, could somebody read that, please? Uh, Genesis 24, 54 to 59. Genesis 24, 52 to 54. 54 to 59. And he and the men who were there with him ate and drank and stayed all night. Then they arose in the morning, and he said, Send me away to my master. But her brother and her mother said, Let the young woman stay with us a few days, at least ten. After that she may go. And he said to them, Do not hinder me, since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away so that I may go to my master. So they said, We will call the young woman and ask her personally. Then they called Rebecca and uh, said to her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. So they sent away Rebecca and her and their sister and her nurse and Abraham's servant, his men. Okay. Thank you, Anand. Right. So if you see this, <clears throat> we see that the family <clears throat> called Rebecca and finally asked her. And she was the one who, who made that choice. She made the choice to decide to go or you know, to not go. So she, she could have said no, but she decided to say yes. So uh, you know, it, it, it's possibly right that she may have had the peace uh, to say yes, OK? Uh, and in a way that uh, um, uh, you know, God, God probably would have prepared her heart to do that. Nevertheless, she was the one she had to recognize recognize that and then say uh, or respond she needed to recognize the guidance that god was giving her personally in order to in order to go ahead okay so uh, um so when when we look at uh, guidance on um on who what are we looking at we're looking at there are certain factors that we're looking at one it should be in the lord it should be a teaching of the scripture it should be an inner witness of the Holy Spirit. Okay, it's a decision that a person needs to make. You're not overriding somebody, the family's decision, and um, you're, you're you're taking the uh, the words of, of the person in in check over there. Okay, ultimately knowing that it is their decision to to be married. So um, so from from what we have understood, from what we have read through, we we believe that. Um, there is just this there's just not this one person but there there can be many people who can potentially potentially become a spouse or become a partner in in someone's life but it is with the guidance with god's guidance with wisdom with the understanding that he gives you you need to make a choice of marrying one person okay and, and that's why we mean to say that there isn't just this one person and that in case you miss that person, then you have missed the chance of being married forever, right? But what we understand and what we believe through this account is that once you have made the choice of marrying a person you think that the Lord is guiding you to um, and who you understand and uh, find through your measures of expectations that they are the most suitable for you, then 
with that two people work together in building a great marriage okay so it is a responsibility of two people to work with that marriage all right so while you are looking out or while you are seeking uh, you're not you're not focused or looking for finding that one person that very one only one and only person for your life but the person you recognize as the one god is guiding you to uh, and you determine would be the right person for you so someone who you god god is that you feel god is guiding you to you recognize god is guiding you to and you sense and you know or uh, through the expectations you've put up is that you determine as the person that is most suitable for you so the one that you choose with his guidance with the um with the knowledge he's given you with the wisdom he's given you finally becomes the one for you becomes the one person as the the very one person for for your life who you would like to marry okay all right uh we're at uh, 10 50 right now let's break for a 10 minute uh, uh break and come back so at 11 o'clock we shall resume class you could just have a cup of coffee and come back at 11.